I am here today to talk to you about navigating uncertainty and managing doubt. These are topics I know a thing or two about, having lived with and recovered from the very worst of the so-called doubting disease. When I went public in 2007 with my deep dark secret, when I shared with the world for the first time that I had been living this incredibly elaborate double life as a guy who was fairly well known on the radio for a lot of years, but also a guy who was unbeknownst to his bosses, his listeners, and his colleagues, was spending unbelievable amounts of time trying to rid himself of the discomfort of his uncertainty. That was my life for many, many years. There are new concerns today about the pace of the economic recovery. Here in California, unemployment continues to rise, the housing market continues to fall, leaving many employers and consumers rather unsure about the future. I love what I do for a living. Not only do I get to work in a booth with some very talented people and interview all kinds of famous newsmakers, I also, through my career and through my outreach, have the opportunity to get up in front of a lot of groups of people, MC events, moderate debates. It's a great privilege to do what I do for a living. And when I published my first book, Rewind, Replay, Repeat, in 2007, I never could have imagined the interest my story would attract. The Sacramento Bee ran a full-page feature on my story. The San Francisco Chronicle ran a full-page feature. The New York Times invited me to write about my experiences. And before long, I was doing media interviews with outlets all across the country. I became fascinated by the fascination with my story. Why was it that people were so interested in this bizarre disorder that I had battled? And what I came to find was that the reason was everybody could relate to the core issues behind OCD. You don't have to have a clinical anxiety disorder to battle what I call a doubt bully. Now, a doubt bully for me is that voice of doubt that asks those disturbing what-if questions. And we're going to talk about the doubt bully this morning because I believe that each one of you has a doubt bully. And again, I don't want to brag, but my doubt bully can beat up any of your doubt bullies. <laughs> But I know that you've got one, because we all do. I want to share with you the genesis of my new book, When in Doubt, Make Belief, and how I came to put that together after traveling the country, collecting stories from people without OCD who could really relate to the core issues at the center of this disorder. I want to ask all of you a question. How many of you in, say, the past six months have backed your car out of the driveway, driven a half block away, and wondered to yourself, did I close the garage door? <laughs> Show of hands. Those of you who are not raising your hands, you either don't drive or you're lying to me. I know this because I have found with audiences all across the country that this is something that we can all relate to. Intellectually, I may know that that garage door is closed, but emotionally, my doubt bully is right there on my shoulder asking, are you sure? But wait, you're asking yourself, isn't doubt a healthy thing? Yes, if we're talking about what I call intellect-based doubt, I always differentiate two forms of doubt because I think it's very key for us to be clear about what we're talking about and what we're not talking about when I talk about the discomfort of uncertainty. The first form is what I call intellect-based doubt or healthy doubt. This doubt is based on reason, logic, deduction, and it serves us well. This is the kind of doubt that would lead to curiosity and caution. We all need it. But there is a threshold that all of us cross in our lives from healthy doubt to unhealthy doubt. By unhealthy doubt, I'm talking about that form of doubt that is based on illogical, black and white, catastrophic thinking. And to make this point, I want to introduce you to a metaphor that I use quite a bit in my talks. I would like you to imagine that you are standing in a cold, dark, lonely, scary place. All around you is darkness. And on the near horizon, you see the glimmer 
of the outline of a box and you walk over to that box and you see that it's a hatch door. You're intrigued because it seems to offer a way out of this miserable place. But here's the thing, you pry open the door and you look inside and before you know it you've fallen in because that door is a trap door. And this is a metaphor I use for the patterns that we all fall into when we're trying to rid ourselves of anxiety by looking for the quick escape from it. Let me share with you what I call the uncertainty paradox. This is at the core of my message and everything that I have ever learned from dealing with the doubting disease. Are you ready? The uncertainty paradox. The only way to effectively manage uncertainty is to embrace uncertainty. Let me repeat that. The only way to effectively manage uncertainty is to embrace uncertainty. And let me share with you my favorite metaphor that drives this point home, because it's a pretty abstract thing I've just tossed out there. Do you remember when you were kids and you jumped in a cold swimming pool and the water was so cold and your brain said to you, cold, 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 get out, get out, get out. But you didn't because you were a kid and you splashed around and lo and behold, the water warmed up. Did it? No. The water didn't warm up. You habituated to the coldness. You desensitized to the coldness. That for me is the perfect analogy for what we do when we learn to sit with the discomfort of our uncertainty. We habituate to it. It dissipates all on its own. The problem is we keep getting out of the pool. We keep looking for the escape from the discomfort of uncertainty, when in fact the only way to effectively address it is to stay in that uncertainty. The water will warm up. The discomfort will dissipate. And that's not just me telling you something experientially. We now know through neuroimaging that the brain starts to dissipate anxiety when it is allowed to sit with that anxiety. Now here's the thing, this is really, really difficult work, sitting with our anxiety. How do we do it? The key, I believe, is motivation. And let me take just a minute or two to tell you about what I believe are the two most powerful motivators we have for learning to sit with the discomfort of uncertainty. I believe they are purpose, and service. Together I call those two motivators greater good. And what I found in my own experience is that when I am stuck in doubt, when my doubt bully is calling the shots, life seems very, very black and white. And my choices at any given moment also appear to be very black or white, right or wrong, good or bad. And good or bad choices, when I am stuck in this shadow of doubt, are defined as good or bad based not on their inherent goodness or badness, but rather on whether or not they relieve our anxiety. So when we're stuck in this shadow of doubt, good choices appear to be those ones that would relieve our anxiety. Bad choices would be those ones that would seem to suggest we need to sit with the anxiety. So when I'm in this place, Place, the shadow of doubt, consumed by my fear-based doubts, I ask myself, what's the greater good in this moment? So I've told you that I think the right answer is to keep walking through that shadow of doubt. But how do we do that? We have to be motivated. We have to acknowledge that the doubt bully is making a compelling case for the good choice to be to relieve our anxiety. Leave that on the table. Accept that that seems like the good choice choice in the moment. But trumpet, trumpet with a greater good choice. And for me, the greater good choice always comes back to purpose and service. The purpose of our lives is to give birth to the best which is within us. That's a Marianne Williamson quote, and I love that. I think it gets very much at the sense of purpose that we all have. Service? Service is about helping other people. So greater good, if you want to look at it, is about empowerment. Empowering others through service, empowering ourselves through a sense of purpose. 
And when we can allow ourselves to find a way in any given moment to be of service to somebody else or enhance our own sense of power, we can motivate ourselves to choose that greater good option over what the doubt bully tells us is a good option. That is my message in a nutshell. Um, I should share with you that I typically give about a three-hour talk, so you got just the, the greatest hits right there, but I hope that was helpful. And I would want to leave you with this challenge. I want you to catch yourself in the moment weighing decisions and asking yourself, are you basing these decisions on healthy doubt or unhealthy doubt? And if you can honestly say that you're basing your question on healthy doubt, you're in a good place. Go with what your intellect tells you. If you catch yourself weighing options based on unhealthy doubt, fear-driven doubt, hit your pause button and ask yourself what appears to be the good choice and if that good choice is a choice that would have you relieve anxiety, then ask yourself what's the greater good in this moment and learn to stand up to your doubt bully. Because I believe that when all of us do that, when we all learn to stand up to our doubt bullies, then we're going to have a society that's making decisions based not on fear, but on service and purpose. Thank you so much for having me here today. It's a great pleasure.